Hey everyone, welcome to Prisma Chats. Uh, in today's episode, we will be talking to Alex uh, from TRPC. We will understand what TRPC is, uh, how we can use it to build APIs. And yeah, like at first we will introduce what TRPC is, when to use it, when not to use it. And we'll also be looking at like some code where we kind of like uh, look at an example, understand how everything works. And then Alex will take over and then show us some really cool stuff with TRPC. But before our beginning, uh, Alex, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, so I'm Alex. I'm a full stack web developer, I guess is the correct title. Uh, I've been doing websites since I was a kid and I'm 32 now, so quite a long time. I started at the LAMP stack, uh, sort of like in the early 2000s. And uh, yeah, I've been bouncing back and forth between backend development, frontend development, native iOS app, React Native apps and stuff over my whole career. Um, and uh, worked in five different startups. And right now I am an independent contractor. Nice. Well, I guess let's get started. So let me just share my screen first. And we will look at TRPC's website. So uh, it's at trpc.io, end to end type safe APIs made easy. Uh, we'll take a look at the different examples. So if you actually go to example apps, I already have the Next.js starter with Prisma uh, like cloned locally. And this is the one that we'll be taking a look at. So before actually getting started, what is the TRPC? Like uh, from my understanding, it's like it's a library that you can use to build your API. And so the first question is like, why TRPC uh, compared to like something like REST or GraphQL? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that I'm sort of born in the LAMP stack. Uh, so the way I started doing web development was sort of uh, write an SQL query and uh, render HTML. And I've always like, even when going to apps and doing APIs and stuff, I've always missed the productivity that I had back then. Sort of like there was no boundary between the front and the back end because back end uh, was front end sort of. Um, and TRPC is sort of like an answer to that. Um, I've been a big proponent for GraphQL um, for a long time, and I jumped on that as soon as it basically came out. Uh, but when I do uh, full, stack web uh, full stack web development and apps nowadays, I only use TypeScript anywhere, everywhere. So instead of introducing another language and having code generation and schemas and that, TRPC helps you simply writing API functions in your backend and then inferring everything uh, from the backend to the frontend. So like in a way, so like with, with traditional like REST APIs, what you have is you have different endpoints and for each endpoint, you just send a request, you get a response. Uh, yeah. The issue is uh, there are no types. So you have to kind of like set up different toolings um, to actually get that type safety. With GraphQL, uh, you have a schema which acts as the contract between the client and the server. But the issue is with uh, GraphQL, you have to kind of go through a lot of tooling to generate these mm -hmm. types. So you have your schema, and then you'd have to kind of like generate the types from the schema, I believe. And then you'd have to use that on the front end and also maybe generate the different queries and mutations. With TRPC, yeah. though, it's a bit different, right? Yeah. So with TRPC, all you have to do is to write a a function on your server and straight away you have access to that function call in your front end. Um, and uh, both the input schema and the output is just inferred from that function. So the sort of contract is transient and guaranteed by the TypeScript compiler rather than something you have to write and document. Uh, okay, so, so this obviously, yeah, continue. Yeah, so like in a way, um, uh, so like in a way TypeScript and like the types are your schema between the front end and the client. You don't need a schema, but like here the limitation is you have to use TypeScript. Yeah, well, you don't have to use TypeScript, uh, but it makes it a lot easier. And yeah. I have plans on making SDKs or like auto-generating SDKs for other languages as well. Uh, however, it is primarily meant for sort of internal APIs in your uh, organizations and organizations that primarily use TypeScript as their language. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. I think uh, we should see like TRPC in action. So let's take a look at the example. So like this is the Next.js uh, example with Prisma and TRPC. 
So I'll explain what I understand like in this project and I'll ask questions and you help me kind of like understand. So awesome. first things first, uh, Prisma, uh, it's installed. I know what Prisma is. Uh, you have your schema.prisma file. So here we're defining the uh, database uh, models. The database we're using is SQLite. And it's so SQLite, it's a file. We have it, it's called dev.db. Uh, it should be, so like it will be included uh, in our Prisma file. I believe we have to run a migration. So we have to do yeah. like MPX. Uh, Prisma DB push. I've done a um, shortcut for that. So I think it should just be to do yarn and yarn dev in order to get that running. So like it's inside the script, but yeah, so like it got generated. So like you have yeah. uh, your dev.db, uh, .db, which is a SQLite file. And inside here, what we have is the post model and a post just has an ID, a title and some text. Yep. And uh, then there's a comment that says to return dates intact through the API, we need to add data transformers. So if we follow this link, we will see using super JSON. So this is actually something uh, that Next.js doesn't give us by default, and it's like it doesn't serialize dates. So what happens <laughs> is that you will run into errors if you don't use super JSON, right? Yeah. So essentially. Um, when you have a date object in JSON, it just gets serialized to a string. So SuperJSON is a library built as part of Blitz, which is a sort of similar answer to the same uh, problem that TRPC is trying to solve, which is the sort of zero API approach. And SuperJSON helps us serialize and deserialize uh, complex objects in JavaScript. So, you, so if you install SuperJSON, you can not only um, return date objects in your uh, in your API and use them transparently in the client. You can also uh, use like maps and sets and even serializing errors and stuff like that. Okay, so that's very useful. And yeah, so like this is the schema prisma uh, the schema prisma file. This is uh, basically our database. And then we have uh, since this uh, kind of like example comes with tests, we have a test folder which uses Playwright. I believe this mm -hmm. so like this is a testing library. And you also have just uh, configured with TypeScript. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then if you go to the source directory, uh, but actually before that, something that I noticed is that in the tsconfig.json, we're setting the base URL to the source directory. So like right. this way it's easier to do imports. We can just, instead of doing like the dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, we can just um, like this, it will be the base URL. So we can just import from like pages or server or utils. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so like the, since this is an XJS project, what happens is like in the pages directory, you have different pages. So actually if I run uh, yarn dev, we should be able to run this project. Yeah. And it runs a couple see. of scripts. So let's, yeah, let's actually look at these. So there are a lot of scripts here. <laughs> like, yeah, I've added some helpers that are good to, to have, sort of like it runs Prisma and stuff for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And when you build it, we also automatically generate Prisma and um, do the database migration. So when you deploy this to an environment, it will be seamless. You will just have like continuous deployments and it will automatically update your database for you. Okay, interesting. So um, right now it should be running at localhost 3000. So if I go there, I'm not sure actually what to expect that. This is the first time I ran this project. <laughs> Okay, so now uh, when we go to localhost, this is what we see. Uh, welcome to your TRPC starter. And we have a link to the docs or ping alex.js on Twitter. That's Alex's uh, Twitter handle. And we have like posts. So there's a title and a text. So I'm assuming we can create new posts this way, right? Yep. So let's assume let's create new post and then say this is a new post. And when I click submit, Oh, here's my new post. And like, wait, so to actually see the text, I won't be able to see it? Yeah, the, so uh, on the front page of this, I've only included the title. Uh, so if you want to view it, you can click view more and you get like the full blob. Oh, oh, so like this is for this. Okay, and we have the ID of this post. So like this is yeah. a route slash post slash ID and we mm -hmm. get like the data. Okay, this is very minimal but yeah uh, it showcases what uh, trpc is so i guess let's look at the code and see 
exactly how all of this works. So inside the pages uh, folder, we know that we have this index.js uh, uh, file. So what happens is, okay, so let me just, there's all this stuff to kind of understand, okay, what is exactly like what is happening. So we have this utils equals trpc.use context. So like, okay, first we have trpc. So let's see, this trpc comes from this utils folder. Yep. And what we're doing here is that we're including the trpc react package and we're importing the type from the trpc server. So like, this is how the types actually reach our front end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, exactly. So what you do is that, as you see here, you import from the sort of back end of your app uh, mm -hmm. with the import type app router, but it's only importing the types of the of your back end. So everything here is guaranteed to um, disappear completely at runtime. It's only used for the compilation of TypeScript. Okay, interesting. And then are we creating our trpc? And this will be like of type router, yep. right? And then we're exporting this router, right? Yeah, so we're exporting a helper for TRPC. Um, so in order to get type safe queries in TRPC, I need to pass in the router, um, the sort of the definition of your router to TRPC. Um, so with this helper that is exported as TRPC here, you get type safe um, functions to call or type safe uh, React query helpers to be specific. Okay, so like now if I go to the index page and here I have the use query, use mutation, use context on like this TRPC instance, correct? Yeah. And so you- Yeah, sure, sure. As, as an example, you can try removing this part and just looking what we have in uh, the auto, like in the auto completion here. So we can we can see here straight away that here we have access to everything that is in our backend, and all of those uh, the name of the sort of routes or procedures are inferred from your backend, and also the sort of the shape of the the response of those functions is inferred on the post query. Uh, so when we iterate through them uh, yeah, further I can down. See it. Uh, you can see that the type here is an item with ID and title. So like if I go down, oh yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> was no, no, that's fine, fine. But yeah, it's like, okay, this makes sense. So like if I hover over like post query, I can see what this post query is. And yeah. I can and see if that you, it has an ID and a title. Yeah, you can if you hover, hover the item, it's cleaner. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So like if I hover over item, I can see it has ID and title. Interesting. So like. Now this use query, what happens is this is like a get request, right? Yep. And for the add post, use mutation. So like this is a mutation and what happens is on submit, we're running this post.add function. Yes, exactly. Okay, so like what is this util? So what is this doing? So like where are we using it else? So like here in this try catch, why are we using this utils kind of like variable? Yes, so in order to tell uh, React query to refetch the posts after you added a post. I call invalidate query. Um, oh yeah, so like under the hood, you're using React query, right? Yes. So like React so, query, for those who do not know, it's like a popular data fetching library, but like it's it's like powerful because in a way it's kind of like GraphQL a little bit, right? Because it has fetching, it has caching, it also updates like the state, right? Okay, so here, yeah. So hood, I under the hood, a, RPC is using it, right? Yeah, I'm a massive fan of React Query. It sort of powers everything cool we can do in React and uh, TRPC. Uh, so I use it. So every actually everything you see on this page is actually server rendered. Um, so uh, React Query helps with both like the sort of caching of sort of and uh, dehydration and hydration. Uh, of um, of your query cache, and it has a lot of help helper functions to do like nice DX and UX for uh, fetching and mutating data. Okay, so like that's how when we click submit, it automatically appeared for us. This is like exactly. magic. Yeah. 
yeah, so after the mutate async is done, it will invalidate post.all, which will then trigger a post.all refetch. And then okay. you will see it. Interesting. Okay, so like this is the front end. And if we go to the underscore app, this is the global app component. There's a lot of stuff happening here. So yeah. what is the HTTP batch link? Yeah, so HTTP batch link. Um, there's some, uh, we can probably dive into that a bit later, uh, but actually when you do a request with TRPC and you use the batch link, if you have multiple requests at the same time, they will be batched together in uh, one request. So if you have a, a very complex page and you're doing like 10 parallel requests at different endpoints, they will actually be condensed together in one, uh, one request to the server. So like this will be better for performance and it will be faster, right? Yeah, exactly. It will be a lot faster for the, uh, for the client. And you don't have to do several round trips to fetch all your app's data. Okay. And like for this logger link, what does this actually do? The logger link is just a helper to get, get like nice console uh, log behavior. So if you reload the page and open the inspector, you will be able to see some sort of like uh, uh, information about what's happening under the hood. Everything we query from TRPC will be shown in the inspector. Whoa, so, okay. So like there's a lot of stuff going on. Here. So yeah, here you can see the light, the light turquoise is sort of like I'm asking for post by ID uh, mm -hmm. or post all in where you're hovering. And yeah, then and I'm getting errors, back. Right, like so the arrows to the right are like you're requesting. And then the response is like arrows to the left, right? Exactly. So now you can actually see here that when you do a post.add, when that gets responsed, we, we sort of automatically query post.all. And here you can also introspect all of the data that is returned from, uh, from the server. Yeah, so like we can see what the input is sent, we can see the response. Okay, this is really nice. Like I, I would, like this seems very interesting because now when looking at the console, you can just understand exactly what is happening. So like if there's something that is not working, you can just look yeah. at the logs and see, okay, I'm making a request, there's a response, what happens in the response. So this is very interesting. So oh, okay. you can also try to do a faulty request. So if you do, if you try to do a post now with a short title or no text, you will actually see. Um, so wait one sec. Let's um, let's go there, and let me refresh, so, and try to just hit submit. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Hey, we get errors. So like, yeah, we made a request which had the input, which was empty strings. But from the response, we just got like a big error, but it says, so like in this result, we have a TRPC client error and it says too small, minimum one. So like this is validation, right? Yeah. And you can actually format this error form, uh, error sort of error response as well. So the error shape you see here, you can actually do an error formatter on your backend. Uh, that is mm -hmm. also then inferred to the client. And you can do things like um, uh, formatting this ZOD error into something you can use in your form straight away from the backend. Okay. So or like... you, can also, you can also use the same ZOD schema on the, on the front end and import that on your backend. So you, you're guaranteed to have the same input validation both on the front end and the backend. So Zod is like a schema validation for the inputs, right? So like yeah. somewhere we have on the back end, like we haven't checked it out yet, but we have like these conditions. So like yeah. this is also inferred. So like we have the schema and like we know when you're creating a new post exactly what is needed. So like on the client, we will also know exactly what is needed. Yeah, so from Zod, we're using two, two parts. First of all, Zod is, so this an a runtime validation library, but it's also written in TypeScript and really type safe. So um, in, in our front end, we're using the sort of output from the SOD types uh, as the input um, the, for, the, for, the, uh, for our input types, which is why you get type safe on the input, but also we ru actually run the SOD schema. So everything is, uh, guaranteed to be that uh, mm -hmm. that shape. Okay, that makes sense. So like, this is <laughs> really nice uh, development experience. So like now, I guess 
with trpc this is a higher order component and we're yeah. using it so like we're just doing an export default with trpc we're passing in the router which we're importing at the top from mm -hmm. the server which we'll look at in a bit and what's happening is that let me just close this so i can get a better look so we have this config which takes in a context but we're not using it and like what is so like here we're calling the batch link and logger link for them to work right yeah so uh, the, the the sort of batch link and logger link is optional things you can do you can also just pass in the url um i try to have their sort of like the reference project actually useful so if you the the links is sort of inspired from how Apollo uh, client or Urkel does their data fetching, where you can actually intercept uh, things before they go out to the server. Uh, so when the client does a call, it's 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 passed through a series of links uh, on the upstream and the downstream. So the logger can then log stuff going up to the server and going down, and you can also split these in different sort of behavior depending on what type of request it is so maybe you want to not have batching on certain requests then you can do a split and and pass uh, certain requests that are maybe slow to like a single uh, fetch request or um, the default behavior here is batching so everything that you do is in the same request okay so like in a way you have with trpc you don't just making calls you actually have a lot of control over how you're making these calls so if you want to batch them if you want to kind of like split them into different stages and like you just have total control over the queries or mutations that you're sending correct yeah so the yeah the links helps you control the data flow uh, of how things are fetched so like, and there, there's uh, documentation about this uh, and i guess we don't have to dive into it in in too much detail but there's a reference link here as well, um, where you can look at that in more detail. So there's like also, is it? Uh, so if you go up a bit, line 46. Mm -hmm. No, 41, Sorry. I mean, yeah, 46. Yeah, there. Uh, this one? You can read. Uh, yeah, there's a link there uh, to oh, yeah. uh, the link to links. Yeah, okay. So like here we can see request batching, customizing the data flow, disabling stuff. Okay. Really cool stuff. <laughs> and like, there's that's, yeah, that is like really cool so far. And okay, so like, so what you're saying is this default export, this is optional or do we have to do it in this underscore app component? Uh, so you don't have to, it just helps a lot. There's also, there's also a, a sort of a TRPC provider that you can use bare bones but then you also have to do you have to do both the provider for trpc and the provider for react query and this high order function can kind of does that for you and it also gives you superpowers in the way that you can just enable ssr with one flag um, mm -hmm. so server-side rendering is just like a, a matter of saying ssr true and then all of the queries that you do in your pages will also be run on the server and we'll so be there on the first here, call. We're setting, so like by default, SSR is true, but if we don't want to use uh, server-side rendering, we can just disable this if we want. Yeah, if you want to do SPA, you can also you can also do specific things that won't be SSR'd. So you can use this sort of links to customize the control flow, uh, the, the request flow, and do certain things that are not server-side rendered or certain things that are. Mm -hmm. So if you okay. sort of do like a, dashboard page for instance there might be things that needs to be, should be loaded straight away on server but it might be use specific stuff that you might want to fetch off the load okay yeah, that makes sense so yeah like it's very flexible library when it comes to like fetching data because it's also like having this library use react query it makes it just really powerful because now you're just aware of like the state you can easily uh, cache it if you want, if, yep. right? And you can also like invalidate this cache because you're using like React query. And you also yep. have control over like the entire request and response cycle. You can see exactly what happens. And from the server, you also like define validation and this validation, like these errors are also like you can view them on the client. Yeah. Okay, so like so far, so like this function get base URL, this is just to know if we're in like production or 
the development, right? Uh, it's sort of um, a bit more than that. So when we do server-side rendering, uh, the URL that you call, uh, so the server then that when it renders the page needs to call the TRPC uh, uh, endpoint as well. And for the clients it's usually just like slash API slash TRPC, uh, but on the server, you might have like a verse, you might want to, you might need to have the full versals URL uh, for the server-side rendering to work or on render.com, um, you have a sort of render internal host name that they mm -hmm. use where the server um, can call itself um, without mm -hmm. going through like internet. Yeah, yeah. So within like the subnet of your render instance, it can call that. So it's really snappy. Okay, so like that's why it would be like very fast. Yeah. Okay, so like now, and then we're also super JSON. This is we covered that why we're using it, and I guess now uh, we can go to the. So like we already visited the in an individual post. So we have this ID. So like this is something next year specific, where we are. So like this is like a dynamic URL. So we have yep. different posts. Um, each post has its ID, and like automatically we will get a page for each individual post. So like what we're, what's happening here is that we're calling a post by ID. Uh, this is a query and we're just displaying it. But like, mm -hmm. I have a question. This, so like post query.status, React query gives us kind of like the status of the request, right? And we can know yeah. loading states and all that stuff. So like no need to do like is loading or any yeah. of that stuff. Okay, that's very cool. And we were like, well, we, what we saw was like, um, raw data and then we're just using json.stringify and we will we're displaying the post query data so like if we actually look at the data it's either post or null or it can be undefined and i believe yeah. this is defined on the server right yeah okay so we can actually dive into this and see how this works yeah so like do we go to the api or do we go to the server so like what's I mean, the you, you can start with the api because that's the sort of what what is exposed to um that's the sort of uh, uh api handler uh for mm -hmm. trpc so, so you see that it's a context yeah and it's just it's like a, this is api rs from next.js where you define uh, an endpoint and like mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're exporting a handler and inside this handler, we're creating context, which comes from the server. We'll look at this and it mm -hmm. includes Prisma. So we have, uh, we, so we can do Prisma queries. And then uh, we also have, we, we are passing the router. So I'm assuming the router, we have different routes. So maybe we have a route for posts. Maybe we would have a route for users mm -hmm. and et cetera. So like here, we're passing this app router, which will contain all of the different routes that we have, right? Yep. And then on error, we're just logging that there's an error. And here we can enable batching if we want, but it's recommended, right? To just leave it. Yeah. To, yeah. Right. It just gives you superpowers without any extra work, sort of. Yeah, like it's just one yes. line. And yeah. Yeah, it's, an, it's enabled by default nowadays. Uh, so you actually don't need to have that, uh, but there might be reasons for you to disable it. Uh, disable it. Okay. Cool. So like now we actually let's get to the server part where the magic is like kind of like happening and we're defining yeah. the types. So this trpc.ts uh, file, we're importing Prisma and we're also importing uh, trpc from uh, trpc slash server. This is the server package. And mm -hmm. we're also importing a Next.js adapter. Yeah. And we're initializing Prisma. We're also enabling like logging and what happens is we're creating the context. So like we can add Prisma, all this makes sense. And we're just exporting the context type. This is the one that we're using in the API route, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then we're creating a router. We're so like trpc.router and we're passing in the context. So this is our router. So like now, I believe if we go to the routers, this is where we're defining kind of like the different endpoints. So yeah. let's start with the app and see exactly what's happening. So in this app, we're importing create router from uh, the this file trpc.ts, and we have the post router, which actually let's look at the post router and see how it's implemented. But like we're importing this post router, and we have this app router, and we're merging this post router that we'll look at, right? Mm. So that 
we're um, we're merging everything in the post router with a prefix of post dot. Uh, so that that's why you see like in the front dot end you all, see po dot post my dot. ID. Yeah, exactly. So then we we split up the whole server into a lot of different routers, like by feature or whatnot. Um, and so then you can have like separations of concerns on the back end. So you can have one for posts, one for users, one for uh, yeah, whatever you want. So like if I want, I can make this like post underscore and it can be then underscore by ID, whatever, right? Like yeah. this is just the convention that of like TRPC. Yeah. So if you, yeah, exactly. It can be post slash as well, if you prefer slash endpoints. Um, and uh, I mean, you can see if, if you wanted to, you can see that if you change this, you get straight away type errors everywhere in your application. Yeah. Like, because we're using like, so like actually let's try it and let's make this like post slash and let's hit save and see exactly don't even like have, what's happening. You actually don't even have to press yeah, like save. Everything. Oh yeah, here it is, post.all. Post.all is not assignable to like um, the types that we're seeing. So let me just move this. Ah, uh, you can hop it out and you see. Yeah, so the available ones that we have is either post slash all or post slash by ID. And that's why we're yeah. getting enters instantly. So like we yeah. just change and we so like we just hit save and we can immediately see, okay, hey, this is where everything is kind of like wrong. You don't even have to press save. But that's really? better. Because so it's like, just inferred. Yeah. So like wait, let's go to which file it was. I think it was the uh, the app. The app, yeah. Yeah. And if we just make a dot, not save. And if we go to the index page, I think we have to save. No, and we no, don't no, have no. to save. Yeah. yeah. And it works. <laughs> this is really cool stuff. So this is very interesting. And now, so like in this app what happened is we we just passed in so like this uh, router we just have the different routes so when we have or like is this accurate so like we have different routers and we're combining them into a single route yeah exactly so it, it combines everything into one sort of something we call an app router um and then we export the types of that app router uh, in the bottom and that is actually what we use in the front end application yeah, so like it was used in the utils, I believe. Yeah. And this is where we're importing here. And like we're just importing the types. We're not actually importing the actual code or anything. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Super so it's just to give a guarantee. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, that, that's the helper that infers all of the types from your back end to your front end. Okay. I like, so like this line is like responsible for like all the magic that we just saw. Basically, yeah. Okay, interesting. So let's just close all the stuff and check out the final file in the server, the post router. So here um, yeah. we're defining two routes. I believe we define the add and the all. So like the all, we can see that. So like, let's actually start from the top. So Zod, we're importing Z from Zod. I believe that's yeah. how you would do it. And yeah. we're, at, we're adding input validation. So in this mutation, this is the add. So we did post.add when submitting the form mm -hmm. on the front end. And what happened was it ran against this schema. So the yep. input, it was uh, an object and we checked that, okay, this ID, it's optional. That's why we don't need to pass it on the front end. But the title, it has to be minimum of like, what, one character and maximum of 32 characters. Yep. And the text, we need to have at least like one letter, otherwise it will break. Yep. And then we have this asynchronous function, it's called resolve. And it takes the context and the input and so like here, the input for it, this is like the argument, right? Yeah. And the yeah, so we only, have, we only have one input argument. Um, so that's sort of inspired by GraphQL. The best practice there is to yeah. generally have just have one input uh, argument in your resolvers. So like, can we rename this to something other than input? Can we name it like args and say here args? Or does it, does it have to be input? Uh, it has to be input. So that is okay. the one input for your function. And you see also that the input uh, in your resolve function is inferred from whatever you define as a schema. So if you change your input schema, you'll have a different input inferred there straight away as well. Okay, so if we add, for example, maybe, um, what do we add, what do we add? Author maybe? Yeah, like author, and we can say like, 
this is z dot string and we can make it also a minimum of like two because an author yeah. might not have more like it's complaining okay no so now if we hit save and we hover over this input we can see that the author has been added yeah okay interesting and, and then, then mm -hmm. and then okay. since it's guaranteed we can pass it straight into prisma because the input so, the, the integrity of the object is guaranteed by uh, by the input uh, input validation so you can just pass that as data into prisma so it makes like prisma queries that easy yeah but like uh, so for example i don't have an author in my database model yeah. so like i can pass it but like here i'll get a, an error from prisma and then it will tell me right yeah exactly so i'm actually surprised that prisma doesn't give an error for this so i guess prisma allows us to fetch extra um extra objects without it throwing but you can see that prisma would complain if you change the data type of like text uh, the text input to a number for instance so if you make this like a number and you and... need to remove the min yeah and now you see yeah. that it doesn't play ball with prisma yeah it says exactly okay you have a big <laughs> error and yeah you can yeah yeah, make these are the bit, like sort of things that are a bit uh, hard uh, with TypeScript in general. Like you get these massive error messages, and then yeah. trying to find the one line of no, this that's... like forty that is relevant to you, right? Yeah, it feels like how dare you try to make this mistake? Oh, by the way, like you just you just added something that is not necessary, and yeah. yeah. So like now, so I, I think this is an issue that should be communicated right because now i can just add fields that i don't have and pass it into this object but um i don't know whether or not this will throw an error right um uh, yeah i actually don't know that um it seems to be that prisma is not explicitly saying that it only accepts these fields but it might be a inherent problem with the sort of record in typescript so i mean let's just skip yeah. that for now <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah so like what we're doing is uh, this is like the final thing and then we can move on to like more advanced stuff and like this is the example project and we have this um uh, query so like what we're doing is we're doing create router and then we're just calling dot mutation or dot query dot query again so like we can just chain the chain this right um yeah. and for each query we're saying query by id this is to fetch the individual post by ID. And we're just making sure that the input is a string for the ID. And we're just mm -hmm. finding, uh, find unique using uh, Prisma. And I'm assuming edit, it will just be like an update from Prisma. Yeah, that was an update and we're just passing in the ID and the new data, uh, same thing as delete. So like this makes a lot of sense. So if we want to maybe have something for users that fetches current users, we will make a user's router, add the queries, the mutation, so like yep. it is in a way kind of like similar to GraphQL. It's just it's different because you just have functions um, that are typed, and these types are on your front end, right? Yeah, yeah, straight and away. You're just calling them, and you don't need to know. So like you get auto completion with TypeScript. If you pass uh, like wrong data types, you get an error. And like yep. so like I guess now that we understood and we looked at like this entire project, my question is. I can also sharing my screen so I can share yours later. Is when not to use type TRPC? Like when does it not make sense? When um, in certain situations I would want to use maybe GraphQL or REST instead of TRPC? Yeah. So I'm not trying to say to anyone that like TRPC, TRPC is, is the best. Sort of <laughs> silver bullet to solve all your problems. It's really good for organizations that are like invested in TypeScript. So if you're an organization where you have a lot of split languages, maybe you have like an Android app in a Kotlin or uh, iOS Swift app and not using React Native or whatnot, maybe it's not for you because um, TRPC works best when you have uh, with TypeScript everywhere. And uh, there's also a certain inherent uh, challenges with with uh, the API being transient in this way. Like if you have uh, app deployments that have versions, so let's say uh, you deploy one app with a certain schema, everything is type guaranteed, awesome, it works. But then later you might do a new 
uh, version of your app and as part, as part of that, change the backend or remove a function, then there's no way of telling that you actually broke the API for old versions. And GraphQL is amazing at that because it's super strict yeah. and you can deprecate stuff and, and things like that. Uh, there are ways of uh, solving this with TRPC, uh, but it's a bit, uh, it requires some sort of uh, tooling to be built. Mm -hmm. um, other things that GraphQL is really good at is like you have the subfield selection, which I don't have in TRPC. Um, but I've noticed myself when I've been working with GraphQL for years, I don't use that too much anyway. Yeah. So the, the, the whole premise is like, you know, you avoid query waterfalls, you have to fetch a post and then you have to fetch something else. Uh, with TRPC, it's so easy to do a, a bespoke endpoint and writing a sort of Prisma query so, so easy uh, that I don't feel like I necessarily need that. With GraphQL, I would need to do like a, a, a one graph to rule them all. Um, and also deal with the sort of complexity of that. There's the n plus one problem. There's the yeah. uh, sort of permission when you go through your uh, when 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 you traverse through the graph. There's a query complexity and all of these considerations that I don't have to think about with your PC. Um, and another um, uh, another reason why not to use it would be if you're doing a publicly exposed API. Um, this is really for internal consumption of your data. And uh, your sort of backend needs to live in the same sort of monorepo as your app or mm -hmm. your front end. Um, so if you want to publicly expose your data, you, uh, it's a, it, I don't have any sort of a, open API or Swagger uh, bridge yet, yet, but I'm, I've been looking into that because I have some, I've had people requesting that feature because that, that would make it awesome to just like, being able to like these two approaches, either I could gen auto generate SDKs based on the, um, what's it called? Uh, abstract syntax tree of what yeah. the TRPC uh, creates, or I could make it sort of open, uh, open API compliant, but there's a lot of things in TRPC that is nice just because it isn't open API compliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes uh, a lot of sense. So I guess now, uh, you can show us kind of like the advanced stuff. So like TRPC uh, can do also like subscriptions. Uh, you yeah. can also like, and I believe you've been working like on a new side project that's called TypeScript Careers, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I can just show the sort of what you, now I can't uh, share my screen. So I have to right, one enable Sorry. that again. Uh, let me show you. So... Should be able to share a screen. Great. And you can see the typescript.careers page. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so the sort of thing uh, that you just saw, I've done a, like a similar version of that, but with some paint thrown on it. Uh, yeah. So this, the, the, this page is pretty stupid so far, but the source code is in the, in the, in the footer if you want to have a look at it. Uh, but this is just a job posting page that aggregates from a few sites and then add posts adding and uh, job post adding and all that uh, as well. Um, but there are some cool things here. So for, for, first of all, when you load this page, it's a service-side uh, service rendered page, but it, it is edge cached. And also when you click anything on the page, if I click uh, an ad, it's instant. I go to next page, it's instant. I go to next page, click an add, it's instant. Um, and that so is like, thanks to... So like this is because it's cached. Now being so like you're actually, made, so it's kind of like you're making a request. There's like, hey, oh, here's the cached version. You don't need to actually make the pull request. That's why it's super fast, right? So there's a few reasons. So first of all, the page in itself is edge cached. So when I load a page, uh, let's see it responds on, in 40 milliseconds on my, uh, my computer. And then when I actually fetch this, after the first render, I prefetch all of the data of every sort of uh, sibling route. So here is a massive TRPC request that you can see that it, it fetches like search, it fetches a lot of job, like public uh, job by slug mm -hmm. and stuff like that. 
And that's actually prefetching all of the things you can click. Um, and the sort of code for that is pretty straightforward as well. Uh, I'm, I'm going to jump into GitHub and show how this actually works. Uh, I mentioned before with query batching and stuff. So this is sort of a reference on what query batching can enable for you. Uh, so let me dive into the index page. It's quite long because I've written all the components in one file. <laughs> but here, here you can see I have, first of all, I have, I have the jobs query. Uh, and then I have a uh, React hook here that when you have fetched all of the jobs, like on the first render, when, when, the, when the app is mounted, I prefetch all of the uh, jobs in a simple for each loop. So that's why when visiting each individual job, it's like instant because you fetched it in the background on this first page load, right? Yeah. And uh, if we dive into the job by ID page, that's using the same sort of uh, query. So that, that has job public by slug. So like, but isn't this done like, uh, isn't this like a bit redundant? Because like now, if I go to an individual post, I'm fetching all of the other posts. So like, wasn't this done already like on the first page? Or like on uh, yeah, so on the, on the home page, I fetch all of the posts, but then since React Queries cache is smart, when I go into this page, I don't have to fetch that. But mm -hmm. cause it's looking at the same cache key, but if I want to load this page, straight up without going to the front page first, it needs that query to know what oh. it's gonna render. Okay, okay, yeah. So like this and is, it, so like the first time if, if someone were to share the link to this job, um, it will be fast because you're using this um, query, right? Uh, or rather when you go to the, the navigation of the page, it will be instant. Like if you go to, to TypeScript career and click anything, there will be no loading spinner. If, and, and also if you, um, but you can still like, you know, um, send, a, send a link to a specific job. And another cool thing with this page uh, is that you can see that in the bottom here, there's no remains of like get server side props or get static props like that. Everything is happening just by uh, using, or I can go to the job page because it's a bit simpler. Uh, if we go to this page, which is pretty simple, uh, there's no get static props or get server side props here in the footer. Uh, it just fetches, uh, it just uses the React query hook. Uh, but still, if I disable JavaScript on this page, it still, it still works uh, so because like TRPC actually server rendered stuff uh, for you in the app. Okay, so like in a way, it feels like you're writing code of like a single page app, but yeah. in reality, it's like under the hood, it's like server-side rendered. Yeah, exactly. So you get the sort of the, the power of like writing your app, like, like any SPA, but when you actually look at it, it will be server-side rendered. And because it's server-side rendered, you can actually easily edge cache it and stuff like that. So Versal uh, promotes a lot, like uh, using get static props um, for this behavior. But you can actually get sort of edge caching and stuff on Verso without using uh, server-side uh, get static props uh, just by setting a cache header in your app. Yeah, so like using the pattern of like um, SWR state while we validate, what happens is you're serving a cache version, but like if it changes, then you would make the request, right? Yeah, exactly. So. Mm -hmm. In this page, uh, now I'm looking at the underscore app. And uh, in this here, uh, we can see somewhere, here is the magic, the magic yeah. of edge caching. So if, the, if we're on the a slash route or on a job, job route, I set the cache header on that. Mm -hmm. And that's enough to cache uh, the whole app. And the same thing is actually true for the API calls as well. So you can see that not only is this page fast, uh, but uh, where, why is it? Oh yeah, disabled JavaScript, so it won't yeah. do any fetch requests. Um, yeah, it still works. Yeah, it still works. Uh, but if we look at the network tab here, you can see that this, this request that it does is really fast as well. 
this sort yeah. of really complicated API call. And that is because I'm also edge caching the API calls as well. Uh, in the same sort of way, like when I get an API uh, API call into my router, um, I have this convention that I should only edge cache, edge cache uh, routes that have the, the word public in it. So I just make sure that everything, uh, all the, the, the queries you're batching has the um, keyword public in it. And then I edge cache that in the same manner. Interesting. Uh, I can show you that as well. Uh, server, I have that in my tier PC, I think. So here I make sure that if everything has the word public in it, everything you queried in this um, in this API call, it will edge cache that as, as well and revalidate every second. So it will just be, first of all, it will only be so slow straight after deployment, the first user that uh, fetches it. And after that, it will revalidate everything every second. Um, and the, the sort of navigation will appear instant for any actual user of this page. So like the experience will be slow just for the first user, but like any other user will just have really fast speeds. So like after deploying, yeah. you just, you visit it and then every user will be like, this is really fast. Yeah. So on this site, I have a cron job that runs every minute to just like revalidate the cache. So, so I just have a cron job that does a fetch call to the, uh, to the sort of base uh, URL of TypeScript careers. And that just guarantees that anyone that visits the site will have it loaded instantly. And also sort of fresh because it's run every, every minute and this SWR is set on one second. So like this is, so like if you don't have this cron job, you just, um, if like in case there are any new jobs, you, the only issue is that someone might have like a slow experience, but like now you're guaranteeing that no one will have like a slow experience because you have this cron job that is running every minute? Yeah. Wow, exactly. interesting. And that, I mean, that's super easy to set up. I recommend this site, cronjob.org. Here, oh, here we can see uh, the sort of like cron job to cron keep fresh here on TypeScript careers. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, that's a pretty cool aspect of, types, of TRPC. And that is thanks to, you know, in, in GraphQL, every, every request is on a HTTP post, which makes it sort of, notoriously hard to cache. And there are solutions for that, like Graph CDN and Apollo has some stuff for uh, edge caching and doing cool stuff with, um, with GraphQL. Uh, but with TRPC, since all of the queries are done by a get call, you don't really need to have that complexity. So you cache it like any other HTTP get call. Yeah, you're just caching the endpoint and you're caching like, so like you're caching the response and that's why you have like just very, very fast experience whenever yeah. making this request. Okay, so, well, this was really interesting. Uh, and then this, uh, yeah, I also have WebSockets and subscription support in TRPC. Although I haven't, that's, I can mention, I have not used that in production extensively, um, but it's really well tested. And I, you know, I mean, the, the, I've done extensive end-to-end -end testing on it and, you know, done my own research. I'd love for so like, someone, but like right now, it's it is experimental, but like uh, it's I mean, close to like being production ready. I mean, it's experimental, but if you're running a non-critical thing, I would love to see people using it in production, because uh, the only reason for the only uh, the only way it, for it to ever become you know certified production ready is if someone actually uses it in production, right? Uh, and I haven't had use for it myself yet uh, to do it. I mean, I built it with intention to use it at my last startup, um, but I never got, I never stayed long enough to um, use it there. Um, but uh, I can show you an example um, of that. There is a, a link where we can chat a bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can share your Let screen me, or is it? Yeah, nice I'll share your screen, uh, but I'll also send you a link here on, I'll send you a link on Slack. Yeah. Uh, Next.js websockets.trpc.io. Yeah. So this is a site hosted on Heroku. 
mm-hmm. um, in order to support WebSockets. If you sign in with your GitHub and yeah, just write stuff. And authorize cat, that's you. Yeah, that's me. One sec. So right now I am logged in and I can send text. So I from. You see that here that he's typing. Oh, you can see that I'm typing. And I can hit submit. Yeah. You see that this is pretty, pretty fast. And that's when yeah. uh, using WebSockets under the hood. Uh, we can see here everything that is passed and sent. Uh, if I send a message, you see here that it does a lot of stuff because it updates like I'm typing and then it does uh, sort of a mutation, but over WebSockets as a transport rather than HTTP. Uh, and the sort of um, pat- patterns that we've seen in, uh, in, uh, um, and the sort of get uh, get and post approach is similar in um, in in WebSockets as well. So let me go to I'll just show the code a bit. Um, source pages index. So a very simple subscription is probably mm-hmm. you see your subscription here. Uh, so oh, here we have, hook? yeah, so we have a similar thing as the use query stuff and we get t- type safety and inference and stuff the same way as we have with queries. Uh, so here we see, for instance, uh, who is typing that we're subscribing to. And that's inferred, the data here in the on next is inferred from the back end. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can then update like who is currently typing, it's, a, an, it's an array with strings. And you can easily use that. And similar here, we uh, subscribe to whenever a post is added. And what I do when we uh, get a new post is to invalidate the queries of the React query, which will then trigger a get of the all the uh, all the posts on this page. Uh, you can do this a bit more granular too. You can like add message and and skip. Oh, actually, I haven't done it granular already. Sorry, I forgot that. So when I get a new post, I just add that to my internal state of this page. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's rendered straight away. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I right. mean, I'd love to for people to contact me on, uh, like if people have use case for real-time stuff in their apps, I'd love to help out and get TRPC in there. So that's it. Uh, we took a look at a lot of stuff. So let's do like a quick recap. Uh, we looked at the TRPC example with Prisma. We saw how everything fits together. We created um, a router for posts to do like uh, different queries and mutations. Uh, we also looked at like when to use TRPC, when not to use it. And then also uh, Alex showed us kind of like some advanced stuff with TRPC, which was really cool. And yeah, Alex, do you have any final thoughts, anything else you would like to add or say? Yeah, first of all, like a massive shout out to Colin, who is first of all the creator of Zod, which is amazing. And also um, he wrote the first proof of concept of TRPC. So without him, TRPC would not exist. Um, and then secondly, the everything I showed today is like not tied to React. So you can use the same sort of thing that we everything we went through, you can do in React Native. In vanilla, um, in vanilla JavaScript or TypeScript, you can use it for server-to-server communication if you like that. And uh, it should work st- like with Vue and Svelte and stuff as well. I'm looking at doing a specific Svelte adapter right now because I feel like Svelte is sort of the future and uh, the Shadow DOM is uh, going out. So yeah. Interesting. Well, uh, I would love to see kind of like what the future of TRPC will look like. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, if you're building cool projects with TRPC, definitely reach out to Alex. He would love to know. And yeah, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.